So today we're covering quiz five from the second semester of organic chemistry, uh, covering chapter 15. And chapter 15 basically was uh, discussing conjugated pi systems uh, and deals alder reactions, um, which is most of what this quiz is about. Um, although the first question here is a little bit different, although it's a very important reaction that we discuss in more detail. Uh, you guys learned this reaction before, uh, but now we're coming back and just kind of thinking about it a little bit more. As I guess we could kind of call it a review in chapter 15 here. And so it's, it gives us a reaction. It says, you know, predict the major and the minor products and kind of describe why uh, one is favored over the other. Okay, so first of all, we have to identify this guy, NBS, with light and heat. This is mainly used to do allylic bromination. It's not the only source, but that's kind of what we've seen it predominantly for so far. So allylic bromination. Okay, so fantastic. What in the world is an allylic group or an allylic position or whatever that might be? Well, an allylic carbon right, is a carbon that is next door to a double bond, right? So we identify a double bond, we look next door, right? And so those carbons in black there uh, would be considered allylic carbons. Great. So if we did our NBS reaction with the example that we just did, right, we would identify an allylic carbon, and at the end of the day, we would plop a bromine down in its place. You'd pat yourself on the back, you'd go home, and um, and then, you know, you'd, you'd be done. All right, so great. That's the basic of this reaction. I guess the question then is a little bit more complex, right? Because now, let me get rid of that, let me get rid of that. What if we have non-symmetric, right? What if we have asymmetric allylic positions, right? Where the black and the purple carbon there are not equivalent positions. And so then we have to go back and think about how an allylic bromination works. It works through, you know, radicals. Right, so we could we would call this radical uh, allylic bromination, and we were just glad that we don't live in the '80s, so that the term radical uh, doesn't mean you know some you know surfer slang for us, right? So radicals means we're going through a radical mechanism. Uh, you guys can go back and review that, right? We have the initiation and propagation and termination steps and all that kind of stuff along the way, right? Not that's kind of outside the scope of this video here. Uh, anyway, so we're going through radical allylic bromination, which means our intermediate is a radical. And so remember, the most stable intermediates are going to typically lead us to our major product. And so the question becomes, well, in our car in our compound in red there, right, where is the most stable radical going to be formed? And so you go, hmm, all right, well, let me take a look at what I have. Right here we've got a tertiary carbon that happens to be allylic, and here's a primary carbon that happens to be allylic. And so radicals we can treat, for the most part, like we do carbocations. And so we pick the most substituted position to form a radical in this case. And so we would, again, in this case, find our tertiary uh, uh, allylic carbon. And we would plop a bromine down in its place. And we would continue to pat ourselves on the back, right? We find the most stable place for a radical to form. And um, then we would... Uh, uh, assume that our major product would lead, would uh, would would come from that most stable intermediate, right? Okay, great. So there's our kind of summary of what's going on. So now we just need to apply the exact same concept to the derivative that we have here. And so again, we look at our product. We say, hey, look, there's one allylic position, right? And there's another allylic position, right? We've got black, we've got purple, right? We go through, we go, hmm, right? Whoops, excuse me. And we identify this as a primary, right? Identify that as secondary. So, okay, uh, that's that's not too bad, right? So, primary versus secondary, we could go through and kind of, you know, make make an assumption about, uh, you know, where the most stable radical is going to form and all that kind of stuff, okay? So, there are, in truth be told, there are a couple answers that are acceptable uh, for this problem, right? There are a couple answers that are acceptable for this problem. And uh, that's why I asked you guys to explain why you picked one over the other. So I'm going to go through one example, although, like I said, there are another examples. And just depending on your answers, you guys could go through. And, you know, if your explanation was worthwhile, then, you know, I accept your answer in that case. So 
uh, as with most things in organic chemistry, multiple right answers as long as you can justify what that is. So here is one answer. Maybe I'll call it the simpler answer. We just simply identify primary versus secondary, right? And we can assume that the secondary radical is going to lead to our major product, okay? Because that's where the most stable radical is going to form. And then our minor product would come from the formation of the less stable primary radical. Although remember, uh, this is not just a primary radical, right? We could put quotes around these, right? It is a secondary allylic carbon, right? And a primary allylic carbon. Remember, we can make uh, primary allylic carbocations, right? They can, they're stabilized by resonance, and that resonance is, a, is an important stabilization factor, right? So this is one acceptable answer here, right? We could make an argument that we have two allylic positions. One is primary, one is secondary. The secondary is the more stable radical, and then, you know, we can go through and make an argument based off of that, okay? The another answer that we'll have to pay attention to is, remember, with an allylic carbon, we can start to draw resonance. And we can go through and draw resonance structures from the intermediates that are formed at both of these positions. So we can form new answers based off of that that are major and minor in both cases. So uh, from what I kind of was looking for, what I kind of thought through, there are about three sets of major and minor products that can come out of this, although it is important to note that not all major products are the same, right? Not all major products are the same, and they're not all going to be formed in the same amount, right? So I was just looking for you guys to identify allylic halogenation and then think about what makes the most stable allylic, you know, what does it mean to be an allylic carbon and how does it stabilize things and, you know, radical halogenations. So just kind of a brief review here in this first question. So hopefully at least the answer here makes sense. Um, and if you have any questions, again, just come see me and we can talk through some of these other answers. I just don't want to make a 40-minute video on one problem here. So <laughs> a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to do. Okay. Fantastic. Moving right along, let's take a look at what we have here. All right, so we got the major products. Excuse me, it's asking us for the major products here, right? We've got a diene, right? There's our diene. There's our diene-o file, right? There's our diene-o file. We're heating this up. So this tells us that this is a Diels-Alder reaction. So a Diels-Alder reaction, right? Um, you know what, let me change colors here real quick. There's my carbons in purple, and let's make the new bonds in black, right? So the bonds in black are the things that form as we form the hexene ring of a Diels-Alder. Remember, in a Diels-Alder, you're always gonna form that hexene ring, right? You're always gonna form this core hexene ring. Then we just have to fill in what goes around it. So if I go back here, so now hopefully you guys see all that forms, and then we have to fill in what's remaining. So I'm going to identify these as green here for just a minute. Now, if you look, those green carbons are connected by that oxygen. So we got to do that, right? So what we're going to do in this case, right, we're going to try our best to draw a wedge coming up to that oxygen, right? They, those things are wedged up. And then... Right, all this stuff here, right, is connected. This will follow the uh, the endo rule, right? So withdrawing groups here, right, likely going to stack with the pi bond over there, right, and follow the endo rule. And so this should be the answer that we get for this, right? Dashed away while the oxygen there coming from the green carbons is wedged up, okay? Excellent. So now we have the product of a Diels alder here, right? So we got to work our way backwards. If we identify the double bond, let me start here, right? There's our double bond, right? That comes from the formation of our uh, from the formation of our hexene ring. That means the carbons directly bound to that, right? The carbons directly bound to that are part of the diene to begin with. So when we break this apart we're going to break after 
those green carbons there, right? We're going to break after those green carbons. So there's blue, there's blue, uh, there's green carbon, right? There's green carbon, right? So let's fill in some bonds here. Our diene better have double bonds in it. And don't forget our methoxy group coming off of there. We'll, we'll notch these in purple here. So our dienophile better have a double bond in it too. And it's got four of those cyano groups on there. Okay. So start by identifying your, your double bond that gets formed in blue. Step one carbon out, right? That's the, all that stuff in blue and green is what makes up your diene, right? And then you break after those green carbons and that is your dienophile, right? Another way of thinking about this is look for electron withdrawing groups, right? Electron withdrawing groups like cyanos or esters or any of those, right? Those are going to be attached typically to your dienophile, right? Those are typically going to be attached to your dienophile. And then electron donating groups like uh, ethers or um, alcohols or... Uh, you know, those kind of, those kind of groups with night, you know, uh, amines, things with lone pairs to donate, electron donating groups are going to be attached to your diene, right? So you can identify the groups that are present around the ring and kind of use that to help figure out also, right? So they're, uh, figure out some systematic way of looking at this, okay? You're always going to form that six membered ring. You just got to break it in the right way. All right. So now we come to the question here, right? Now it gets a little bit trickier. Um, here is our, there is our diene, here is our diene file, right? And just real quickly, right, there's an electron withdrawing group, there's an electron donating group, right? That's another way of identifying this, right? So we have two options here, okay? So let me draw the ring out. I think this is how I did it previously, right? We have that, and I'll just dot my green carbons there. You plop a double bond there, and black to purple, okay? All right, let's come back in and fill in some of the stuff. So we have that option there, right? Or I'm going to draw this again. I'm going to skip the colors. All right, I'm just bringing those two rings together. Or we have that option there, right? Those are the two options, right? We have an asymmetric dienophile, right? We have an asymmetric dienophile coming in. And so here's where we have to pay attention of 1, 2, 1, 4 versus 1, 3 uh, substitution, okay? Now we talked about this in class when we looked at resonance structures. Right? From our electron donating groups here, right? We have the 1, 2 position, right? To get to our withdrawing groups, right? Or the 1, to three to get to our withdrawing groups there. So we're just looking at how we can end up substituting things, right? What is going to be the major product, right? The major products happen to be the one, two, or one, four additions, right? One, three additions are not preferred uh, just because of how the, uh, how the molecules can overlap, at least with our orbitals. And right? so this is gonna be the major product that happens in this case. Right, so go back and take a look at your notes where we discuss uh, electron pushing with generating plus and minus charges and how those plus and minus charges end up. Right? And it's also in the book where it talks about 1, 2, and 1, 4 versus 1, 3 additions. So this stuff isn't, it's not that bad, right? All you got to do is just draw your two options and identify whether it's the 1, 2 or the 1, 4 version, right? And then... Um, you know, you can you can move from you, you can you can draw the, the 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 product from there. Okay, but the way to explain it is that it's based off of resonance structures. Okie dokie. So we got the same type of question here, 
right? There's blue, there's blue, there's green, there's green, right? There's our diene, there's our dieno file, right? We can draw our two options, the one two versus the one, uh, the one three or the one four version here. So we got this, we got that, right? There's my blue carbon, there's my green carbons. I'm gonna make the new bonds in black to my purple carbons, okay? And then we just have to identify what's on each one of those. So again, when we have an asymmetric, right, we identify we have an asymmetric dieno file, so we have to worry about our 1, 2, 1, 4 versus 1, 3 addition, right? So we, when we have an asymmetric, right, we're going to have to apply that same rule. So we're going to draw both of them, right? We're going to draw both of them, and we're going to figure out what the answer is, right? So let's go through and do that. Um, let's add our ether group here. This guy doesn't need wedge or dash, right, because it's sp2 hybridized there, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, we have either our cyano group there, right, which is 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3, 4, right? It's either 1, 2, or 1, 4 away, right? So this is a 1, 2, 1, 4 product. I mean, we could stop there because that's what we really want to look for. But let's draw our other one just for practice sake. Right, our other product would look like this, where we would have our cyano group over here. Right, so we're just picking both sides of where the purple carbon, right, where these purple carbons are. And here we have one, two, three, and one, two, three. Right, so this is our one, three product here. Right, so again, we're going to be picking that guy right there. Okay, draw both of them, draw or draw your resonance structures would be even better and then take a look at what's going on from there, all right? Deals alders can be kind of tricky, but you got to do a little bit of practice, and then actually they don't become all that bad, right? Because we're always going to have that ring. We just have to connect the right things around the ring, right? Oh, my goodness. I realized I just forgot a big important thing. So let me go back and correct, right? I forgot. I forgot these guys right here. So let me add those in. Doesn't change our answer any. I apologize for that. Right? I just wanted to add those guys back in there. Okay. Moving along. <laughs> resonance structures. Okay. Right. We can't answer a lot of our questions in organic without drawing resonance structures. Um, again, as with most of the problems in organic, there's quite a few answers here. Although, uh, right, you know, some resonance structures are better than others. Draw, remember I made this correction, draw all the contributing, right? So we're drawing all of them. All right, let's go to town. Resonance structure number one, right? So we're starting from our alkoxide there, the phenoxide oxygen. Looking for my black marker here. Apparently, I was having trouble seeing colors. We got this guy. We got this guy. We haven't done anything over here yet. There it is. There it is. We dropped a green carbon there. Okay. Walking around the benzene ring. All right, so we got that bond there now. One pair over there now. And that's over there. Keep walking, keep walking. So we made this guy, that guy here, and then we got our lone pair here. Fantastic. And we end up back where we start. We plop that down and kick that back up. Right? And then we end up back where we started. Good. Okay. Now, subtly, right, our 
ether group over here, we can start to draw resonance structures with that too. Okay, so let's do that. If you guys want to pause the video, this would be a great spot for you to, you know, get ahead of what I'm about to do. good at drawing hexagons as you go through organic chemistry. I mean, not too good. Apparently my drawings are not too good today. That should be a plus. Got our double bond here. Got our double bond here now. A little pair here. There's a minus. And one last one. Right, and we end up back where we started. Okay. Now, we could go through and have a larger argument about which one of these two, right, the green pathway or the purple pathway, which one would obviously be the more, let's say, contributing structures, right? And we would clearly say the one in green would be the more dominant resonance structures, right? The ones in purple were, we've got a lot of charges, two negatives and a positive, right? You know, the one in the, the one on top there, the one in green would be better, although we can't discount the ones in purple either, okay? But that's what we we're looking for, right? So I was looking for uh, some of these resonance structures here. Remember not to over-octet things, always show your charges, always show your arrows, all these kind of things that go with it. All right, so I'm going to zoom out and scroll back so you guys can see. I should indicate that this is a, you know, this is a major product here. So um, I'm going to scroll out uh, or zoom out so you guys can see the answers. And we will call it a day from there.